All right, in this lesson, we're going to go over public accounting firms, which is probably the most important thing to understand when we talk about external auditors and kind of how they work and kind of what goes on in a public accounting firm so that when you decide to walk into a public accounting firm, you kind of know the lingo and you kind of know what's going on with these public accounting firms. So first of all, let's talk about the organization and composition of these public accounting firms. Typically speaking, a public accounting firm can be composed of either proprietorship, general or limited liability partnerships or corporations, and then corporations. Now, what limits a public accounting firm from being one or the other is typically the number of people that are partners in there. So for instance, you can't be a proprietorship and have five partners because a proprietorship is only for one partner. Okay. Um, secondly, you can't be a partnership if you're if you're running the accounting firm yourself. So you can't be a general partnership if you are a one person, one man show. And so therefore you have to be a proprietorship. The other thing that we have to think about when it comes to what type of organization that we're going to be is state laws. So states typically govern the way that an organization can be set up. A lot of states do not allow professional service organizations or professional service companies to be corporations and therefore that limits the ability of a public accounting firm to be in a corporation and have to choose something else. Now the, really it comes down to um, what state that organization is going to start in or are practicing in and a lot of times we're going to see these major big organizations form LLPs. Now again a lot of them would love to be an LLC but they can't be an LLC because of laws in their state or in most states. And if you're a CPA and you're practicing in many states, your organization has to follow all of those state rules. And a lot of times, a lot of those state rules means that you can't be a corporation as a professional service firm. So it's just easier to be an LLC, uh, sorry, LLP, and then that you're taking care of all of your states. Okay. Now again, many big organizations, many big service firms like to be LLPs because they can't be corporations. So the next best thing are LLPs. And for two reasons. Reason number one, it provides greater personal protection against lawsuits. And the key word here is personal protection. We're not saying firm protection. So just because you're an LLP doesn't mean that you don't get sued. You do get sued. But from a personal standpoint, uh, it protects it against lawsuits. And then partners are not personally responsible for liabilities arising from other partners and most employees negligent acts. Okay, So what are we talking about here? Well, let's think about what a proprietorship does. A proprietorship, so you have the owner, the company, or the owner and the company. Okay, And this is a proprietorship. If someone was to sue a proprietorship or a general partnership, they could sue the owner or the company and the owner at the same time okay because there's no personal protection between the company and its and its owners so if someone gets hurt in the store they can sue the store but if the store doesn't have any capital that person that's suing the store can also go after the individual because there is no legal protection for proprietorships and general partnerships okay so that's also why a big major accounting firm doesn't want to be a general partnership or a proprietorship is because if uh, investors decide to sue because of an audit opinion that was given, then all of the partners' assets would be exposed. And when we say all of their assets, we mean their homes, their cars, their uh, money, their retirement. All of that would be exposed in a lawsuit of the firm. Okay, even if that partner had no, um, didn't cause a negligent act. Okay, but because they're an owner of the firm, now their personal assets are exposed to the firm's liabilities and lawsuits. In an LLP, on the other hand, we still have all of our firm owners, okay, and they own this accounting firm. However, because an LLP provides limited liability protection, so you, LLP stands for limited liability partnerships, but LLP could also mean limited liability protection, it would mean that if this owner right here did something wrong, caused negligent, and because of their opinion, it was getting sued. The whoever suing them could sue the company, but could only come after this owner's assets. Okay, they can't come after these owners' assets. Now, let's be clear on what assets we're talking about: personal assets. 
So even though that the firm is getting sued, the firm itself could be giving some of their assets, which are owned by these owners, to the person that's suing them. Okay? So it's not that their business assets are free from that protection. It's only their personal assets, their home, their car, their retirement, their savings. But their business asset would obviously be used to pay off a lawsuit and that partner who caused negligence. So the nice thing about an LLP is that if I'm a good partner and I'm doing everything by the books, the worst that can happen is my investment in my own company would be wiped away, but they couldn't come after my home, they couldn't come after my savings, they couldn't come after my investments, they can't come after my cars or my assets because of that li limited liability protection that an LLP offers them. Now, let's flip it a little bit. If this was an LLC and this happened, someone sued the firm, and in, a, in an LLC situation, they couldn't come after that negligent partner. Okay. So again, accounting firms would love to be LLCs, but a lot of states don't allow them to be LLCs, so the next best thing would be an LLP, and so at least it, it only exposes the negligent partner and doesn't expose the other partner so that they can be protected um, from getting their assets taken because of another partner's wrongdoing. And again, this is... This is not just accounting firms. This happens in a lot of doctor's offices where it's a, cor a consortium of doctors. They like to organize as LLPs. That way, if one doctor has a malpractice suit, then that doctor would be responsible. The LLP would be responsible, but the other doctors would not be responsible, and they would keep all of their assets. Okay? So LLPs is generally what we see a lot of big accounting firms. So if we think about the big accounting firms, KPMG LLP, Deloitte & Touche LLP, EY LLP, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers LLP. Okay? Now that moves us into the next kind of um, discussion on what are these national firms and what are these firms categorized. And so in the United States and pretty much throughout the world, we categorize public accounting firms into three different areas. The first one is called the Big Four. And the Big Four are pretty much your big multi-international organizations. They do audits all around the world. They may have different partnerships within it, but they pretty much are one brand that deals throughout the world. They also bring in the most money of all firms, and so we kind of classify them by size when it comes to revenues that they bring in. And so the big four happens to be uh, Ernst & Young, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Deloitte & Touche, and KPMG. Those are our big four, multi-international organizations. A step down from them is also organizations that don't bring in nearly as much money as KPMG. I think KPMG is the number four firm when it comes to net revenues. Um, so they don't bring in nearly as much as KPMG, but they're also important to the landscape of auditors. Uh, these organizations are typically national firms with international affiliates. What is an international affiliate? An international affiliate is saying is this. I open up a firm in the United States as, let's take one of our uh, examples, Grant Thornton, GT, as Grant Thornton, but I may not want to expand into other countries, but I need to expand into other countries because uh, financial statements are becoming more international than they are domestic. And so what I do is I have an affiliate, so I sign on another firm in, let's say, London, that will bear the name of Grant Thornton, but not necessarily be owned by the same owners as the domestic Grant Thornton here in the United States. So they are an affiliate to us. Um, it's almost like a franchise. Okay, So we have Grant Thornton, and we have a franchise in the United States, and then we have a franchise in London, and then we have a franchise in China, and we have a franchise in South America, and so on and so on. So they all kind of work independently, but they all work together at the same time. What an affiliate allows them to do is if there is a client here in the United States who needs an inventory observation in Europe, then we can call one of our affiliate offices there to have them do the, the work for us. Um, and when they do the work for us, we also pay them um, so that they're getting paid for it, but then they're also providing us that same level of service we expect someone if we were to take our uh, staff here and send them to Europe to do that inventory account. So international affiliates. Uh, but a domestic kind of purpose. Okay, So uh, we also call these national firms mid-tier firms. So we have the big four, and then we have these mid-tier firms. Examples of mid-tier firms are Grant Thornton, RSM, McGladry, and then BDO, Seidman. So 
Those are three of our national firms or mid-tier firms. And then below them, typically, we have what we call uh, regional and local firms. And we have more of those than we do these national affiliates and big fours. And regional and local firms are basically exactly what it is. It's regional firms, so firms that are regionally located. So maybe they are in the Kansas City area, and maybe they're in Wichita, and maybe they're in Dallas. But that's pretty much it. They're not really anywhere around um, outside the Midwest. And so they have a regional presence, but they don't have an international or even a national presence. And then we do have a lot of local firms. The local firms are typically your proprietorships, but your local firms pretty much only uh, do audits or are public accounting firms in a certain local area. Maybe they don't want to expand because if expanding would also require additional uh, partners in, into the organization, or maybe the, they have a good clientele and that, that's what they do is they do, let's say, farm audits here in the Midwest, um, but they only do it out of their Wichita office and that's what they're known for. So um, kind of that niche market uh, product. Okay, So that's the type of accounting firm classifications to understand. Again, big fours do have more resources than the national firms, although the national firms could say that they do have just as much resources. Maybe a little bit different. Maybe it's not all in-house, but they have the same resources. Um, obviously, the regional and local firms don't have as much resources as the big fours and definitely not um, uh, the same resources as international uh, these national firms or mid-tier firms. Um, so choosing which organization you're going to enter in will depend on what you want to do and where do you want to take your career at the end of the day. Okay. Now, within the public accounting organization, and we're really talking now about our big four and our national firms. Regional firms do have this, so it's not that regional firms don't have this. Regional firms do have this classification that we're going to talk about next. Um, local firms do have that, but a lot of times it's resource constricted, which means that they don't have the re necessary resource to have this classification ladder for all of their employees. So when you walk into your public accounting firm for the first day, typically you're going to be known as a staff or an associate. And so there is a corporate ladder that exists within a public accounting firm. And so this is what that public uh, accounting corporate ladder looks like right over here. So in the audit, and this also happens in tax a lot of times, but in the audit ranks, we typically start here as a staff and associate. So if you're a first year greenhorn, as they would like to say, you're considered a staff or an associate. Now, depending on the firm that you go to, the bigger the firm, the more steps they're going to have. Um, this next part will be a step, or it may not be in a step. So, for instance, um, step two would be semi. Now, this usually happens at a big four because they have a lot of individuals in their organization. But step two is the semi. That's kind of the in-between uh, the staff and the senior. Now, the semi pretty much is given that title because they have uh, more knowledge than the staff member does underneath them. And they also provide help to that staff member at the end of the day. Now, after that senior, we jump over to, uh, sorry, after that semi, we jump over to the senior, or what we like to call in charge. Now, up until this point, the senior, the semi, and the staff are typically assigned to one client, okay? And that client, they go there, they do the audit. Once they're done with the audit, then they're assigned to a new client, okay? So the senior or in charge is in charge of the audit itself. So if you go into a client uh, and you want to see who's in charge, it's the senior who's in charge. They're the ones that are making sure the audit is getting done. They're kind of that base level, entry level management who everybody, all, the upper management goes to to figure out how well that client is doing and how well that audit is doing. They are ultimately uh, responsible for the audit from a day-to-day -day perspective. Now, jumping from senior, we get to manager. Manager usually um, has a caseload. And so unlike the senior or the in charge who is there day to day with a client, the manager oftentimes is the one that has a book of clients. And so that manager may have four or five different clients and each day rotates between each client or maybe because one client needs a little bit more help this week, they're gonna that client. Um, and then the following third at another client, or maybe they, maybe they never even step on to the site of a client um, because the books are super easy to audit or um, they trust their senior at the end of the day. So typically speaking, a manager will have a, a bigger caseload than the senior. So when we tag a manager for uh, what clients they're on, they're usually on multiple clients at the same time, whereas a senior is only given one client at, at a time. Senior manager is kind of that promotion level right above that they're kind of in the wings of being a partner or an, uh, of the organization. 
Um, so they pretty much do the same thing as a manager. Again, they're kind of like that semi. They're not necessarily promoted to anything, um, but they're that middle ground ready to be promoted to that partner level. Now the last thing in the top part is on an audit rank or audit ladder is that partner or director. Now the difference between a partner and director is this. Director does the same thing pretty much as a partner, but they don't have equity shares in the organization, which means they're not actually technically an owner. And you might ask, why would someone get all the way up there and be a director and not a partner? And the reason may come down to maybe they don't have the resources to um, uh, pay for partnership. Uh, and a couple other reasons may be that they don't necessarily want the sales part of the partnership job because a partner's job obviously is to bring in more clients. Um, so a lot of times firms will say, okay, you can be a director, which means that you still get to do all of your work, but you're not necessarily needing to go out and find new clients and bring new clients within the organization. Um, and directors often are, can sometimes be specialists. So maybe they specialize in this one area or one industry, and they're not necessarily in the purpose of being a partner at the end of the day. They're just there as a specialist, but they've moved up the ranks so that they're, that they're becoming, they are considered a director. Okay? Different organizations have different uh, reasons why someone would be a director versus a partner and so it's not to give you a generalization that's kind of where a director is at the end of the day now a partner again owns the organization or owns a part of the organization partners also in charge um, of an audit so they are the responsible party for the audit so we said that you know the senior here is the the manager that's in charge of the day-to-day -day process um, the partner is not necessarily in charge of the day-to-day, -day, but they are the one that's in charge of the audit. That partner is also the one that will sign off on that audit at the end of the day. Now, from a review standpoint, everybody below is reviewed by the person above. So, for instance, that semi could review that staff member's work papers. The senior will review the semi and the staff work papers. The manager will review the senior semi and staff's work papers. The senior manager will, will typically uh, review the manager, senior manager, senior manager, manager, senior, semi, and staff, and then the partner will review everybody below it. Now, what are work papers? Work papers is the actual work that's being done to test certain things within an audit. So, when you hear work papers, it's the actual papers or the evidence that we've actually tested a part of the financial statement. So. Uh, from the line of things that happens here, the partner will review all of these work papers. Senior manager will typically review everybody's work papers below, manager, senior, semi, and staff. So that's kind of how it works. Now at a smaller organization, there is no semi, and there may not be a senior manager. So there may be a staff and associate, a senior manager, and partner. And how long you stay within each one is dependent on the organization itself. Some of the big fours have what we call age limits, uh, mandatory requirement age limits. And so they may say at 59 or 62, you must retire from the partner or director position. What that allows it, the organization to do is always pump up this ladder. So someone that is, that is at the staff will always get promoted to semi or will always get promoted to senior at some point as long as they're meeting the criteria of being a senior. But they're always being promoted because we're always letting partners go. And that's really an, actually a smart leadership technique because you're, not always, you're allowing your people that are under you to also climb that ladder and be able to climb that ladder um, efficiently and timely and it allows them to have purpose within the organization which also helps retention. So this lesson again is all about the public accounting firms and then also the ins and outs of public accounted firms corporate ladders.